still uh, follow the zero uh, COVID uh, policies or uh, your government changes now? Yeah, we have uh, 29 cases of Delta at the moment. Uh -huh. um, and we so the border is still very tight. Yeah, uh, but Delta got through and I think it's 20, 26 cases, maybe 40 cases. Not many. Sure. Not now many. In, Viet and, and no, now in Vietnam, we have around 15,000 cases a day. So I understand because to start with, you were very successful, weren't you? You kept it really low. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it doesn't take much for it to escape, does it? Mm. Yeah, but borders are very tight here still. Mm. <laughs> hello, teacher. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, good morning. <laughs> good morning. Uh, Sorry, Joanne, we're just going to wait for like a couple of minutes and we will start. Yeah. Okay, no problem. Because uh, I still have some online students as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, so would you like to, you know, like later on, we start with the quizzes or you want to go some period and then we're going to do the quizzes? It's up to you. So which, which way? Yeah, I've, I've put some slides together, which is a recap of yesterday to remind people what we went through. So maybe we do that first and then perhaps go through the questions and answers. Yeah. And then we'll go back into what, what we were talking about. Yeah, thank you. Right. Ngồi gần mic không nghe rõ, mà ngồi gần loa thì mình nghe rõ. Không, cái camera này này, nó đặt trên ở giữa cơ. Ngồi đây nó vẫn bị chiếu như thế này mà. Quan sát kỹ lắm. Em cũng biết là khẩu trang là mới mà. Em không nói khẩu trang thông thường đâu. Thôi mua đấy nhá. Dạ. À đúng rồi, thì chị này sẽ quay 180 độ đeo là nó sẽ không bị mờ. I think um, we can start now. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome back. Uh, this is day two of a two day course on business continuity management. Um, as, as I said yesterday, if, um, if I'm speaking too quickly or um, you don't understand, but words or the 
terminology I've chosen to use and please let me know or let us know and I can repeat perhaps using different terms. Um, I'm conscious that of course it's um, I'm speaking my my sole language and you're having to listen and understand in, in a second language. Um, I'm also conscious that I went through quite a lot of ideas yesterday, quite a lot of which will be new to most people, if not everyone. So I thought we'd start today with just recapping just some of the key slides that we went through, uh, just to remind people. Um, and then we'll go for questions and answers uh, that we finished off yesterday before then starting again the where we left off, which was exploring risk management basics so that we can move to the next step and do a risk assessment for different departments or parts of the business. So I'll share screen. Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, so just a recap of day one. Uh, firstly, what was the objective of the training? That's to develop a good working level understanding of business continuity management and planning as applicable to all parts of a full service airline group and to form a foundation for a development of core expertise in business continuity management. And on the agenda, we've been through the fundamentals of BCM, the nature of disruption, past examples, and KO requirements, and I'll mention of IATA guidance. We then looked at developing a BCM framework and how we may manage events, and we just started on risk mapping the business or parts of a business anyway. Okay. So if you recall, we started where we're talking about the context and the key point that you are a large, complex, dynamic uh, business that relies on a lot of different functions working together, interdependent functions uh, that are critical to delivering your service You've, and you also of course uh, fulfill a social uh, need of connectivity exercise about what are the difference between perhaps acute or sudden disruptions, slowly developing disruptions? And we talked briefly about how that may impact the business and also how it relates somewhat to emergency management. And some good ideas were put forward. I then step through that making the point that disruption is pretty common in the aviation sector uh, and here's some albeit slightly older examples but very normal examples of how um, uh, in aviation in particular is dependent on continuous uh, information security and IT systems and the cost of disruption can be very high, both to the customer and to the airlines. Uh, but disruption comes in in many forms. Sometimes aircraft are damaged by natural events, such as volcanoes, pandemic, of course, which we're living through. Um, fuel supplies can be disrupted. Power can be disrupted. Weather can cause disruption or significant weather. Occasionally we have um, war-like situations or security uh, situations. And from time to time, uh, um, labor disputes, aircraft get damaged and maybe off offline for some 
considerable time. And of course, IT systems were totally reliant on. But also from time to time, there are much more significant events that have a far reaching effect on aviation, particularly aviation is particularly sensitive uh, because it relies on the, the ability to travel between nations and the willingness for people and uh, to travel as well as the ability to pay for that travel. So anything that causes a, uh, security full of natural hazard event, the volcano. And a couple of other I, um, events were also put forward. Put forward. I then um, briefly um, explained that while we all know that a KO requires us to have emergency response systems, less well known is that that expectation extends to the continuity of a business. Uh, emergencies and disruptions. Um, and it's it's worded to cover both. And also the expectation there's a swift resolution of a problem or a disruption and a return to operations or a return to service. So we must be able to respond to unexpected situations, disruptions, or even potential disruptions. I also briefly touched on that ACAO has some guidance, albeit it's largely focused on emergency response, but it does touch on crisis communications, command and control, humanitarian responses, etc. And also the need to assist other airlines, so mutual assistance. I did in my view, a lot of preparing and writing and proving you've done something because it's a certification basis for certification uh, rather than really focusing in a more uh, efficient way on exactly what the business needs. Okay, then I started to introduce some ideas some models to think about how, what types of disruption there can be and how we may respond to a different intensity and likelihood of a disruption. And if you recall, I built up a, this diagram. So the key point here was that there are quite frequent, in the aviation business, quite frequent disruptions, minor disruptions, whether it's weather delays, um, hold ups at airports, aircraft becoming not available, etc. Um, but there are less frequently, there can be quite significant events such as the examples we just talked about. Um, they're much more severe, but less likely. So these are described as routine or minor problems just day-to-day -day problems and the business is used to managing. Sometimes you can have localized problems that affect, say, a department or a function within the business. And occasionally there may be more significant disruptions where there needs to be some priority set in between how to respond, where to put resources or the focus and what to, to recover first. And lastly, there may be very significant events that really almost change the way we do business. So to respond to this, these different types of events and the frequency of events, what I suggested was we could call this routine or routine control methods and typically standard operating procedures, airline operating procedures, um, 
but we simply we we sort of understand these problems quite well we have in place the right people or sufficient people and resources to simply follow a series of instructions and continue business however when it becomes a more widespread problem still quite localized perhaps it affecting only one department or function um, we need to coordinate a response um, to ensure a quick return to service and we can largely predict these events and prepare for them and this is where business continuity really starts on a much wider problem where there is priorities there are priorities that need to be determined and managed we need dedicated response teams uh, to be able to respond make the decisions communicate both upward Lastly, for the very severe situations, I'm suggesting that a command and control style response is really what's required. You need to make very rapid decisions, a significant trade-offs perhaps in for a business and costs, and that can only be done at a senior level. Okay, so that was the first model I presented. Um, this is why I feel it's necessary to recap because really I presented you with three different models yesterday or ways of thinking about the business. Uh, this was another idea. It's not one you have to use, but it's one I found seems to work very well. Is the idea of understanding how the business functions. Some parts of a business are there to gain business, to, to seek customers or identify and satisfy customer needs. A large part of a business is actually delivering that service. Maybe, maybe freight or it may be people. There's also a part of a business that clearly leads, that manages the whole business and ensures that each part has the right resources, et cetera, and is following a strategic purpose. And then there's another part of a business that supports the whole. And if we split a business like that, we can still need to recognize that some parts of a business, because it's aviation and it's happening 24-7, are essentially real-time functions. They have to work now. They're happening all the time. There's probably shifts of people working through the day. Um, two or three or four people manning a particular desk, for example, and just taking turns on shifts. Um, and so they are really time dependent. Uh, they may be in gaining business, or maybe delivering service, or maybe in the support field, largely. There is another strand of a business that we can call imperative. They can't, they can't stop for long uh, because there's really supporting the real time parts of a business. And then lastly, there's other parts of a business where time is less pressing. They're working on longer time frames, perhaps through a schedule spanning months, projects, uh, and other support functions. So that's I'm, I'm suggesting is a useful way to look at how the business functions and what to help us to start to identify what is important and what type of business response do we need to put in place. And I gave a, a case study example, which was a operations center or a building that contained so a number of really important real-time uh, business functions, or most of them would be real-time, um, and how having identified a significant risk to a business for anything that would disrupt the ability to use that building, uh, we set up a, a four, four back location where just the really critical functions could be carried out. A connectivity, a power from a different source. Uh, you could get to it from a different um, routes. 
it had we fitted sufficient equipment like aerials and communication systems to ensure that it, the airline could be run for at least a short period from its alternative location. Okay, uh, having presented that, um, I then went on to introduce a third model. Sorry, it was quite a lot I was introducing yesterday. And this is the idea that we, we can consider business continuity management as effectively four phases, which in some textbooks is called the four R's because in English, the words used or sound of R, reduction, meaning risk reduction, reducing the risk to the functions within the business, being ready to respond to events. And then after an event occurs, um, actually responding to the, that to recover the situation and then possibly longer term a recovering ability or fully recovering the market. So this idea of the four R's, which I personally think is a very, very effective model. Uh, and I think it's been around a long time. It's certainly in, in many textbooks. And then I showed how that might look in, in practice, uh, if we considered aviation emergencies, site emergencies, workplace emergencies, and business continuity. In aviation emergencies, I suggest we, uh, we follow operational standards, internationally accepted ways of doing this, um, and reduce by ensuring the business, the operations run correctly and in full compliance with rules and regulations, trained pilots, etc., well-trained crew, mechanics, uh, then for readiness, we have emergency plans, we train people, we carry out exercises, and we may have dedicated response teams. In fact, a KO requires dedicated response teams for airline emergencies. Um, and then should there be an emergency, most airlines will have an emergency center and they'll follow IATA guidance and it's largely a command and control style response where the lead of the emergency response directs operations and ensures the priorities are, are, are clear and that each of the teams is fulfilling their role, whether it's informing next of kin or going to a site, uh, communicating with other agencies, etc. And then there's a business recovery phase, which is supporting staff uh, and possibly re brand, recovering the brand or communicating with the public. And so we went for these four and the business continuity one in particular, I pointed out we're here. Um, we need to profile, risk profile of business to understand what type of response or how to, re how to reduce risk. Firstly, what is the risk and how to reduce the risk. And then also, having determined what the risk is and what the threat is to the business or that function, put in place plans, um, response plans, communication plans, and from time to time exercise them to prove our work. Um, and it's probably managed at the department level. But also you may have response teams for more significant events. Response will be managed uh, either by the business continuity management teams or a manager, department man managers, and there'll be coordination between them all. And then finally, you've got to recover the business. It might be simply recovering aircraft to correct locations, or it might be much more extensive than that. It might be recovering or ensuring that all passengers have been, needs have been met, everyone's arrived at the destinations they plan to get to or might, might be much more significant and a longer time recovery uh, period and I gave you an example of
models uh, are introduced. So as conscious, but it's kind of introducing quite a few ideas. Uh, before then, just briefly saying, well, this is all very well, but how much do we spend on it? How, how much resource should go into business or continuity management? And I, I pointed out is as really a, a balance between risk and cost, how much cost to protect the business versus how much risk are you protecting against. And I gave examples of some figures. Um, I got a sense actually that people were surprised how big these figures were. Um, I should remark that of course this is, I think this is intended to include all aspects of recovery, including perhaps say an alternative data center, uh, which can be quite costly in themselves, um, as well as the time costs of exercises, etc. Sorry. And I've got a on my to-do list is to find a link to see if we can find a, a more up-to-date version of this, if not this one. Okay, um, then we started on understanding risk and near the beginning of a course, uh, I was asked whether there was a need to understand risk. And I said, yes, which is why we're now gonna go through, we're now stepping through, what do we mean by risk and how do we carry out a risk assessment? sufficient to, to aid business continuity planning. So I talked about the effect of uncertainty on the achievement of objectives uh, as an international standard, 31,000. And um, so what do we mean by objectives? Well, why do we interest in objectives? Because risk is not meeting an objective. So we need to understand the objective of each part of a business. And I went through some points, some more detail, but most important point is that risk is typically uh, considered in terms of consequence, how bad the outcome be, and the likelihood of that occurring. So the likelihood of an event occurring, and how bad the consequence. These notes uh, coming from the international standard. So I reiterated the, the need to understand the objective of each function or department within the business. And we're about to start an exercise on that. Before then introducing in very simple terms what the international standard on risks says, it gives us a framework, it sets out some principles of effective risk management, and it gives us a process. And I went through in some detail on the process. And that's where we finished before doing the um, questions and answers. So that's a recap of what we covered yesterday. It was quite a lot of material and I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that. So that's why I thought it was important to go through and remind everyone what exactly we talked about. Okay, are there any, um, any questions or points before we go through the 10 questions and then start on our risk assessment process. Vâng, các anh chị có câu hỏi gì không ạ? Trong cái nội dung mà ngày hôm qua mình đã học ạ. No. no. Doesn't look like it. Okay, thank you. Um, so maybe we'll do the the questions and answers now, and then start into the risk process. Yes, so for number one, the question will be the name of the most significant disruption globally. In the last 30 years, we got answer for 9-11, uh, COVID-19, SARS, 9-11, a recession 2008, 19, COVID-19, SARS, again, COVID-19, financial crisis, the world, uh, first world, SARS, crisis, first world again, a lot, yeah. No, com very comprehensive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, COVID-19, quite recent, 
Class 2003, the session, yeah, the kind of, yeah, yeah, uh, 911, the session. Okay, yeah, all very reasonable examples. Oh. Oh, very precise. Mm -hmm. Yep, so uh, question number two. Uh, we have 84% of the select B as ICAP. And the question will be uh, what organization besides that airline and airport develop BTS, uh, BTP model? Yeah, so it's a K over requires it. Um, IATA does offer guidance. But, yep. So the uh, correct answer would be B? Yes, we would. Yep. Number three, uh, the question is within the course material, which of the following is correct response for a very worst case description? 60% select B, command and control. 16% uh, is C, coordinate response, 12% routine control, and 4% dedicated response team. Mm. So that's meant to be the top of a triangle, um, which was command and control. But interestingly, to be strictly correct, even if you're in a command and control situation, you are likely to still have coordinated responses in place. And you may well have dedicated response teams. So I wouldn't say C and D are strictly um, incorrect, but um, but routine, routine control, no, it's not routine control. Mm. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Number four, uh, questions, which is the following come first as part of PCM? And 60% uh, select reduction, 20% mm -hmm. response, 8% recovery, and 4% is pregnant. Mm. Okay, so the correct answer is reduction, which is reducing risk, risk reduction. So that's the first step of this four R's process. We skip number five, but people still do number five and still... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we can... Uh, uh, and most people got a correct answer. Even though we skip, yes, but number five, very good one. So six is when carry out BC and risk assessment, which represents the highest level of risk, and 68% select A major and likely to occur, and 24% is minor consequence and unlikely to occur. So a uh, question uh, answer A is the correct answer. Yeah, and we'll we'll be going through that very shortly in some more detail. <laughs> yeah. Seven, uh, if a typical day-to-day -day aviation disruption event occurs, which is the most suitable response? And 52% select B uh, using the SOP, and 24% is A applying the major disruption plan, 16% select code in the uh, emergency team, and uh, yeah. Okay, so the correct answer is D, and that's a, the bottom of that triangle that I showed, where it just sort of disruption we're used to. We know how to respond to it. Uh, we have the resources to hand and we just follow the instructions, the yeah, SOPs. Okay. And number eight, the international standard for business continuity management, 64% select the ISO uh, 31,000 and 20% select the 22301. And 8% select the 31010. Okay, this is interesting. Um, it's actually the first one, uh, answer A. Um, and if you recall, it is <laughs> the, one, <laughs> the one I listed, but I was somewhat dismissive of, shall we say. I said, I, I personally wouldn't use it, but it is the international standard. So um, the question, answer A is the correct answer. So. 27,000 is the uh, information security or information 
technology okay. security standard? I, I do believe that people mistaken the brick with the uh, BPM. Yeah, yeah. So 31,000 is would be the correct evidence. So if a question had been, what is the international standard on risk management? And answer D would have been the correct answer if the question had been, what is the international standard on risk analysis? Mm. Oh, or techno technical analysis, yeah. in Mallorca during the recovery from the COVID pandemic. And we got lots of uh, market share, lack of human resource, inconsistent growth. Mm -hmm. Very good. Lack of human resource. I think we're missing two, but yeah. Uh, Try licensing, fatigue risk, and non-compliance risk. Mm -hmm. uh, market share, lack of human resource, inconsistent growth as well. Uh, um, unemployment. Okay, that's an interesting one. Just to recap, unemployment clearly that that could be a risk to individuals, um, but I don't think it would be seen as a risk to the business. If you were not able to employ the correct people, so unemployable, um, that might be seen as a risk potentially because they're not trained. So what if you have to lay off and you have to pay the employees something so that they can leave the company? Uh, Very good. Leave? Yep. No, but yep. So the cost of laying off large numbers of people, oh. that very much is part of a, a risk to the business. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And next one will be procedure for cotton. Subject for... Uh, listed in the um, ACAO uh, risk map for post-pandemic equipment not fit for purpose because it hasn't been used for a long time, for example. Mm. So we do have uh, preserved business dynamic. Government have to strike balance between support to the aviation industry uh, and encourage investment to improve the sustainability of the industry as well. Okay, that's an interesting one. I think that's that's quite a subtle one, so quite a um, complex one. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Where the, yeah, okay, interesting. Uh, restructuring organization. And, yeah, uh, potentially. Mm -hmm. We do have the uh, clumsiness due to loss of ability, uh, Lack of endurance during long haul shortage supply crew as well. Mm -hmm. uh, restructuring again, reducing staff, and change in leadership. Mm -hmm. A lack of capital, fire, fire, I mean, like personnel, I think, mm -hmm. and business opportunity. That's an interesting one. Yeah, missed opportunity. And human resource. Uh, uh, license, fatigue, and non compliant risk. So, unemployed, many people die. So, um, economic recession as well. Okay, so lack of demand. Mm -hmm. And uh, but debt, I believe. The need to service increased debt. That's an interesting one. Mm -hmm. Uh, company structure, labor skill, and uh, reduction of income. Mm -hmm. So the occur for recovery will be another wave of the COVID hitting us. 
and social anxiety regarding the customer. Interesting one, yeah. Uh, market share losing as well, inconsistent goals and lack of human resource. Uh, then we've got the final one will be bankruptcy, restructure and management change for leadership. Okay. Interesting. Uh, really interesting examples, I think. Yeah. For another link, because we have two, we do have lack of manpower, pandemic, uh, still spreading, and the worry of um, the, the people as well for traveling. Mm -hmm. Willingness to travel. Mm. So it was uh, related to training, so lack of training as well for ground safety and so mm -hmm. labor shortage, new mutation, and travel gear. So is that uh, affect an uh, economic crisis and changing customer behavior and habits? That's an interesting one. Mm. Lack of manpower as well. Uh, so it's the same as um, many people die and enjoy an uh, economic recession. So HR, passenger demands and finance. And uh, pilots, is, um, they lose the skills because they, they uh, have less flight to, to take for a long time. Mm. And the same as uh, concern for pilot skill will be reduced due to the, um, the less time to practice and time. And lack of staff because um, they need to by another job to be laid off. Um, it's changed aircraft to freighter because we didn't have passenger, but only cargo. And passenger come back after the COVID, but the normal flight um, still reduced. So that increased rising the, the inflation. Aircraft fleet of allied to stock. Uh, the debt increasing inflation and mm. shortage, reputation, revenue, and experience of the staff. I think that's it for number mm. uh, Really interesting range, there, isn't there? There's um, it's quite strategic impacts, very significant to the business. There's, there's clearly a lot of concern about um, currency of training and availability of skilled people. Uh, there's operational impacts um, and more brand related impacts. It's, it's a really interesting range, I think, everyone that comes up with. There's clearly um, a recognition that this recovery period is not going to be easy. I think, and it's going to take a lot of management. Mm, interesting. Yes, and finally, we, uh, we show that number 10 is what do the following terms stand for? Mm -hmm. And we've got ITBR stand for IT disaster recovery, uh, BCM, business continuity management, BCP is business continuity planning, and EP. EMP is emergency management plan. That's right. So is that correct? The first one is it correct? The first one is correct. Yes. Yep. Okay. So everyone would know. Yes. Yep. Yeah. I think it's good. Yeah. We should be Yeah. Number one. Yeah. So number ten is uh, almost everybody got the correct answer. Then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So the last one, emergency management plan, is not in the slide. Is it not? It's not. I have to look up in Google. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. There we go. Yeah. 
uh, good old Google, <laughs> which might explain why uh, environmental management plans mentioned on the second one, which is in a different context would be correct. You know, you can, it can mean that, um, but in this context, it's emergency management plan. Yeah. Um, oh, interesting. I didn't list that. Ah. <laughs> so I think that maybe that's why the next person yeah. made it environment and that's and right. Management. Yeah, yeah. Um so, there we go. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Very good. Oh, interesting responses to uh, particularly the post-pandemic period. Um, yeah, that's that's. Uh, I think is some real people are really thinking about that one. Um, clearly, I wasn't very clear on the um, international standard, which one I was referring to. So um, we'll recap that again. Mm -hmm. So now okay. Your screen, right? Yep, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone for taking part in that exercise. Okay, I'm now going to restart us back on where we were before. Um, okay. So if you recall, um, I stepped you through the risk management process. This is so that uh, we are equipped to carry out a risk um, assessment for each part of the business. And I said how we need to understand the, the scope of the exercise, what's the context, you know, what are the rules that apply, what's part of the business, um, et cetera, and what is the criteria, what, what must be met. Uh, you're yeah. not showing your screen. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and again, I've second time I've done that, isn't it? No problem. Okay, this should help. Okay. So uh, we've got to this point, and I focused on the risk management process. Uh, and I talked about the first step is understanding the context and uh, of the assessment, uh, for example, the department, what its purpose is, uh, what is the objective. That's a really important point, why, why I labored or why I focused on that word objective. It's that each part of a business has, to, has a certain purpose or objective as part of its role in ensuring that the service is delivered, the uh, airline service is delivered or the engineering services delivered, or the ground services delivered, depending on what, what business exactly you're in. Um, and then we have to go through the step of identifying risk to determine what are the threats or what could prevent uh, the department or the function being delivered. Um, and then how we, we need to analyze that, decide how, what level of concern what level of risk is involved, if we're happy with that level of risk or not, and therefore whether we have to treat it or mitigate or reduce the level of risk. So that's the first of the four R's, reduction. Uh, and I also said that at time to time, we have to review, monitor and review our risk assessment to ensure it remains up to date as situations change. And we may have to consult, communicate, consult with other parts of the business. And possibly report if there's a re requirement to report your preparedness, how prepared your department is, then obviously you need to be able to report that. So that's a point at which we stopped yesterday. So please stop me or show if, if there's anything you want to cover again. So, 
first we have to think about the theory of and how we apply the process and then identify risk across the group. So at its very simplest, the way to analyze risk. So I'll step through that first. So if re re you recall, I said that risk was a can be considered a combination of a likelihood of something happening, how frequent it may happen, and how bad it may the outcome may be. So this is a, a very simple risk matrix that allows us to rate a level of risk between, oops, sorry, low risk, medium risk, and high risk. So at the very least, we are starting to get some priority. Where do we need to focus most of our effort and maybe less effort? So if we, I'm sure some of you will have seen matrices like this, they're usually five by five often, but they can be quite simple, particularly for business continuity management, they can be quite simple. So for example, if the impact or the consequence of an event is high or significant, and it's likely to occur, we expect it to occur, then that's a high level of risk. So we could use a different word here. We could say major, major consequence, likely to occur, it's a high risk. These numbers here are just a guide. It says, in very simple terms, we're multiplying these numbers. So this is the highest level of risk. The same consequence though, if it is unlikely to occur, the event is unlikely, we'll call that a medium risk. Because if it does occur, it would be quite bad, but we're not expecting it to happen. So we'll call that a medium risk. At the other extreme, if we have a, a very low impact or minor impact, I'm sorry, I should have really used major, moderate, minor here. Um, and it's likely to occur, okay, it's not a bad, too bad, you know, it's not good, but it's not too bad, but it keeps happening. It's constantly happening. So let's call that a medium level of risk. Conversely, if it's a minor impact or a low impact and it doesn't happen very often, then clearly that, that's a low risk. That's not so important to us. We don't need to give so much priority to that. So that's a very, simple but effective way to look at risk. If, if it's something we want to avoid something because it would be very significant, they may be in cost when the ability to service customers, um, then that's important to us. So it's either rated a high risk or a medium risk. A lesser impact as a, a problem, a disruption, but not too costly, say, not too much of a disruption to service, uh, can only be a medium or low risk. And in the middle, we have sort of a middle level of risk or a middle level of harm and a possible versus a likely or unlikely. So we need to be clear or consistent on what we mean by these terms, but the concept is pretty simple. And this is used many, many locations with simple risk matrix. Like I say, it can be a little more complicated. You probably have five levels of likelihood and five levels of impact. But for our purposes here, this is probably sufficient because all we're really trying to do is, the most important is identify a risk. Okay, at least we know about it so we can think about it. And then we want to prioritize. What do we do first? Do we put more effort into or more cost into mitigating a certain level of risk? And as long as it's reasonably consistent across the business, that is probably sufficient for business continuity purposes. Okay, so this is quite an important concept. So are there any questions? Is that fairly clear to everyone? So okay. like, uh, six points in both the uh, uh, medium effects and likely and uh, another six point in high uh, effects and uh, the, the middle possibility. So 
if you have limited resource, what do you put when priority? So if you had um, one here and one here, yes, you'd give them the same priority. Yeah, they're, they're both high risk, so we need to be concerned. It may be that one is easy to mitigate and another isn't. It may be that one you can mitigate it without having to. easily and then the other one will have to put a bit more time and effort into thinking how we do that one or maybe we do it next year when we got the budget so in practice i think usually it's self-evident fairly clear what to focus on uh, i think the other thing to remember these are just tools to help us make decisions um, maybe discuss it with the next level of a business up and say look We've got these risks, they're rating the high. Which do you think we should do first? Uh, is it better as another department who needs to do something similar? Shall we combine resources and work together on a risk? So it's this is a tool to help you make decisions. It isn't like a rule, you must do it. Uh, you must do that one and that one. Mm. Does that make sense? Okay. Mm. So it's it's tool it helps us to make right decisions in the right order and to debate perhaps debate with other about resourcing and when we do do mitigation efforts um, sometimes a mitigation like we say it can be very very simple but other times it, it may be quite cost and quite um, complex so in a way we some of the decisions or And then, and then we'll work our way down as we can. So I can give you the next example. It's just a very simple, but example of, uh, it's actually a real one, but I've just changed the, the reports and the names to give you an example. It is one that I personally have used, or I've had staff use this one and done the work for me, obviously. Um, so this is a sort of a first level. There we go. So in this case, um, like I said, I've changed the, the words. We, these aren't the, the ports that I personally was working with, but this perhaps makes it easier to understand. So I've said, OK, well, we've got certain regions we fly to. So let's just have a look at the overall level of risk for a given airport to so this is a fairly high level piece of work where do we think there may be significant or higher risk of disruption to the services so here in this case we went through and we um said well okay we've got some american ports we've got some asian ports we've got some australian ports we've got european port uh, here, Honolulu, Los Angeles, San Francisco, but actually have quite a high natural hazard profile, either volcanic or earthquake. So these two in particular, they could well suffer an earthquake that could put them out of action for quite a period of time. Uh, and so you can go through this exercise and think, well, here's some uh, Japanese ports, similar problem, quite a high natural risk profile. But others, pretty benign. Uh, they're not really threatened by any natural hazards, very stable locations. Um, so we'll rate them as low. And then how about infrastructure? Are there any ports where the infrastructure may be 
less than reliable. So in here, we rated them all low, except Cairns, which we said given it a medium, because it's quite remote from the main power systems, for example, it might be. So don't, don't take this as absolute, this is just an example. And it, I, I gave you, a, a, it's to show a range how you go through the process. Another hazard we may want to consider is civil unrest, for example. So, okay, you'd think American ports are probably all, oh, but there are riots and the like, not that uncommon in, in some American cities. So we'll rate that one a bit higher. There has been some civil unrest in Hong Kong, so we'll rate that one, but otherwise we don't seem to have much effect. So we can go through um, whatever, uh, threats we're interested in. This is a very high level exercise um, to get a general picture across the business of where there may be um, a level of risk that we need to be aware of. So for example, why are we interested in civil unrest? Well, it may be it, it, where do we house our crew when they're resting over? What hotels do we pick? Maybe we need to put more effort into choosing hotels in certain locations to ensure the crews are safe, but also that they can get back to the airport easily, if, if necessary. So there may be all, a whole range of, of um, decisions that may be made, and maybe short-term decisions you know, made fairly quickly, but others are, are perhaps longer term. Oh, let's consider that. We're, we're aware of these issues here. So next time we reconsider, for example, hotels, or, or root structure, we'll just be aware that there's a certain level of risk associated with certain ports. Um, and, and from a business perspective, there's certainly potential impact on the schedule. Uh, maybe you think, well, we need to be aware, maybe it's nothing we can do, but just let's be aware that some ports represent higher risk. And overall you can, and you could sum all these, for example, so there's a, say that's a six and a three and a one and a three, I think. Um, sorry, that would be been a, yeah. Um, and this could be useful beyond business continuity plan. It could be useful for, in terms of a, a review of security, a review of crew safety. Um, so it has some additional benefits of going through this sort of exercise. So uh, as an example, um, it's a broad one across the whole business, but we can do a similar um, exercise using our risk matrix to consider at a more detailed level for each department or each function within the business. Okay. So what I was hoping to do is start um, Let's have a look. Uh, hoping to do an exercise, but we'll see whether we do it in this one or the next step. Risk map and exercise. So here's some of your own ports. Um, and I thought we could break, break up into groups and see if we can rate the risk. Now the problem here is we haven't really defined impact, but if you think of impact as um, disruption to the service, this would be a very high disruption to the service, a medium disruption and low disruption, and then go through that exercise. Do we think we can do that? Is this, do you feel you've got enough information now to, to try that exercise? There's no right or wrong answers but maybe pick just, I don't know, three ports. For each group, pick three ports. 
Uh, Tian, are we ready to break up into groups? Can we break? Have we got groups set up? We can break into groups, yeah. Yep, okay. Um, and we perhaps spend 20 minutes on this. So do you want to take the uh, discussion and then after that we go for a break? Mm -hmm. uh, come back. Then we can discuss. Yep. Okay. Brilliant. Um, and it'll be a bit of a warm up for the next exercise, which will be more uh, down in the business, perhaps, uh, which um, which I think will people find, might find uh, a little uh, easier, actually. But this will be a good exercise of just using uh, just using the risk matrix and getting some sense of how you use these. Yeah. Thì uh, mình sẽ có khoảng 20 phút Mình sẽ chọn là ba cái địa điểm Ở trong nhóm của mình muốn thảo luận Và về cái matrix Chúng ta về cái ma trận vừa rồi á Thì phải có trình bày ra cho mọi người là Ở đây để mình có thể đánh giá được ạ You notice there's a slightly different number in system on this matrix But it doesn't matter It's just to give a, a sense of So we can arrive at an overall score yeah. À, thầy có giải thích là cái ví dụ ở dưới cái hình này á, cái đỏ cái vàng với lại xanh á, thì thực ra đây là cái, cái giá trị tương đối thôi mọi người có thể thay đổi và mọi người biện luận cho cái giá trị mà mọi mà các anh chị cho lại trong bảng đấy à, để giải thích với cả lớp và với thầy ạ ok ok give up a minute ừ.
Gerard, can you stop sharing so I can share the... Uh, sure. Okay. Em đang gửi Duran, do you want to move from groups to groups? I'm just actually just refining some of the next slides. Okay. okay. Just, okay. Um, okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 